Hounicon. 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 You're listening to Hounicon Podcast, highlighting citizen Potawatomi Nation issues, members, and more. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. Just search Hounicon Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Paige Willett. Today's episode discusses the effects of Medicaid expansion on Citizen Potawatomi Nation Health Services, visits a crafting class at CPN's Cultural Heritage Center, and provides tips and tricks for credit scores for National Credit Education Month. On June 30th, 2020, Oklahoma voters approved the Oklahoma Medicaid Expansion Initiative, becoming the 37th state to make state health care coverage available to those at or below 133% of the federal poverty line, approximately 200,000 adults between 19 and 64. Citizen Potawatomi Nation Health Services has seen the total number of patients enrolled in Medicaid per month increase from 300 prior to coverage taking effect on July 1, 2021, to 1,200 in 2022, and the numbers continue to grow. Communications Coordinator Mary Liefer discusses the very close statewide vote for Medicaid expansion and some of the program's common misconceptions with CPNHS Affordable Care Act and Medicaid consultant Yvonne Myers, who has more than four decades of experience in public health. Why does expansion matter? Basically, when the Affordable Health Care Act was put into play and they were looking to assure all of our populations could have access to affordable insurance. It's kind of the three-legged stool, but one of the things was for individuals who had incomes less than 138% of the federal poverty level, they were supposed to be approved for Medicaid. They would just automatically be eligible to enroll in Medicaid at no cost to them. And then individuals in the higher income levels could seek insurance through the marketplace and have premium tax credits to offset those. Well, there was a case filed, and the Supreme Court ruled back in 2012, 2013, that it was a state option, whether or not they wanted to expand Medicaid. And at that time, basically, states could have expanded Medicaid, and the feds would have paid 100% of the cost. And then you had so many years before you pick up like a 10% state match. So, I mean, basically you're looking at, it would cost the state maybe 10 cents of the dollar for their junior population to do that. And yet we didn't do it because we politicized it. Where I stand is Oklahoma should do what's right for the people of Oklahoma. We want the people of Oklahoma to have access to care. And as a tribe, we do a fabulous job of assuring our members and the people that qualify for services get that. But that's not true for all of Oklahomans. They did a um, referendum where they, they signed the petitions and they brought it to a vote of the people. So tell us, what are some of those benefits, uh, both to an individual and to the entire state of Oklahoma, that come from expansion? You basically had our poorest and most fragile population that didn't have access to care. And so now if they need their preventive health services, at no cost to them, except there is a minor, uh, like a $4 copay that that some individuals pay. For tribal members, there is no out-of-pocket costs whatsoever. That That's one of the special provisions for American Indians and Alaska Natives. You know, I, I've talked with individuals who they've needed just the standard preventive health tests that need to be done. They've needed shoulder surgeries. They've needed different other access to care. And uh, especially for their family members that are not tribal, where you've got a a household of tribal and non-tribal together, the tribal members could come in and access things through the IHS and tribal and urban Indian clinics, but their family members didn't have that same access. Now, if I'm a, a, an individual that uh, I myself may already have coverage and I don't really understand what, what the benefit would be to me since I already have coverage, uh, telling the people of the state in what ways do they benefit, even if this doesn't affect them directly? 
sometimes if you're in the field, you hear mentioned uncompensated care. So when individuals that don't have insurance go hit the emergency rooms of the hospitals, they have no benefit to pay for that. And so the hospitals wind up writing those costs off. And, it, and that's why all of our health care costs go up, because there's not a payer for that. And with Medicaid expansion, it's here to help pay for the services. And rather than going in and flooding an emergency room, that they can come and get the care and establish a relationship with a primary care physician that will care for them. They can access services through an urgent care facility. And then when they do have emergency services, they can access it through the emergency room. So we're several months into expansion, and how is it going? How is it looking for you? It, it's excellent, but we can always do more. Um, you know, the initial estimates in Oklahoma is they thought we would have about 200,000 people that would meet the criteria for uh, Medicaid expansion. Well, as of this month, uh, we are at 244,000 people enrolled. Uh, Over 33,000 American Indians have been eligible to enroll under Medicaid expansion, which I think is excellent. For the Native American population, actually it doesn't cost the state anything. Because of trust agreements, uh, we, we draw down 100% federal funds for any services that are rendered through a tribal facility, an IHS facility, or an urban Indian clinic is, is now going to be eligible for the 100% FMAP. What have people told you so far about their experiences and perhaps some different ways that they are being helped by expansion? For individuals who do not live close to tribal facilities where they can easily access their care, uh, the ability to be able to access services locally if they need to. The other piece is that for that mixed family that I mentioned, for the, where you have the non-tribal spouse that has not been able to get care. Uh, I had one lady just, you know, kind of break into tears, and she said, my husband has needed shoulder surgery for years, and we can't afford it. And you mean now he can go in and get that surgery? And I said, Absolutely. It's not welfare, it's health care. In its real-time eligibility, you literally can, if you complete that application and you meet the eligibility criteria, you can have your your insurance in place that day through Sooner Care. Many of the tribes, CPN being one, are agency partners with the Oklahoma Health Care Authority, which is the Medicaid agency for Oklahoma. And we can do a real-time application. Uh, Our staff are well-trained, and it's very easy for us to do one. So uh, CPN Health Services, talk about the ways that they've been able to respond and maybe some of the ways that they prepared knowing that expansion was coming. We worked with the healthcare authority coming up with ways to maximize how enrollment could be done. What CPN did is we made sure that we had our benefit staff aware and trained on our agency view application and then worked with intake. So for individuals that didn't show any insurance benefits, that they would be referred to a benefit staff to assist them and their family in potential enrollment. We've been in unprecedented times where you may have always had a good household income, you had your insurance, but the world turned upside down with COVID and people that had jobs no longer had jobs and they were without insurance. And so here's the opportunity. And so I basically say, if you're unemployed, if your income has reduced, if you have no insurance, the most uh, important thing for you to do is reach out and see if you could be eligible. You know, what I hope is people listen and think, you know, I have a granddaughter I have a, a daughter, I have a mother, a father, I have a neighbor that this might benefit, and, and we stand ready to help them. Find more information about Medicaid expansion from the Oklahoma Health Care Authority and apply for benefits at mysoonercare.org. Visit Citizen Potawatomi Nation Health Services online at cpn.news backslash health.
Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Cultural Heritage Center offers art classes several times a month as a service to the greater surrounding Indigenous community. Led by Cultural Activities Coordinator and artist Leslie Deer, participants typically learn how to bead a piece of jewelry or create a piece of regalia. Oh, does that make sense? Because yeah. typically you want to just kind of come up and go back through this hole right next to the one you already Today we are making uh, hair pipe bandoliers, which these are uh, bandoliers typically worn by men um, as part of their uh, regalia in the arena. And uh, these bandoliers we're making are two strands that uh, goes probably from one side, either your left side or your right side, across your chest, over your shoulder, down your backside, and meets up again where it started on, on your side at your hip. Participant and Choctaw Nation citizen Chriselle Baker enjoys Native crafts and making new friends. She keeps up with the Heritage Center's classes online and always looks forward to a new challenge, including the bandolier. Honestly, I didn't know what it was, to tell you the truth, and so I was like, I want to learn something new. And so here I am. I got in the class. Ponca and Muskogee Creek tribal member Jill Premue Hunter plans to give her bandolier to a new dancer as part of his first set of regalia. She chose red and yellow beads to represent and honor the element of fire. Hunter knew the significance of bandoliers before the class. Traditionally, these were um, these represent the the bullet casings that they use for veterans, and so used, originally it was just veterans that used these to dance with. But now all, almost all the dancers use them, whether they are or not. It just kind of has evolved into that. But that's what I was told by my, my dad was that they were for uh, veterans, and that's what it represented as part of their warrior, you know, wear for, I use them for straight dancers mostly, and I think that's mostly who wears them. CPN tribal member Charles Scott also attended, sitting next to CPN District 12 legislator Paul Schmidlkoffer. Scott began taking classes a few years ago as an opportunity to make regalia pieces at no cost. While he gives away many of his completed pieces as well, he wants to keep his first bandolier. Scott picked red and purple to go with his ribbon shirt for the dance arena. And, and, I mean, if you, know, if you go to the store and buy it, it's really not special to me. So if you make it, then it's special. Uh, I've met people down here who've made me stuff. You know, my ribbon shirt, for example, it was made for me. So the, the more you come down and the more we do this culture stuff, the more other people come down and use it. Does that make sense? The process of beating and crafting includes making mistakes, and Schmidlkoffer is no stranger to taking apart and redoing sections of his work. Three times? In a row? What happened, Paul? <sighs> See? <laughs> it wouldn't be such a big deal. You, that bead right there, though. Yeah. This is the third time it's coming off. Oh, no. He has taken almost every class available at the CHC since he retired after making a promise to himself to learn more about Potawatomi culture and language. Even when he messes up, he has fun. And Leslie does a great job of uh, explaining how to do things and very patient. And on several occasions, she's helped me undo my bad work and correct it and uh, end up with a quality product at the end. So love the classes, a lot of fun. The uh, fellowship is good. He focused on a green and yellow palette, making his bandolier match the rest of his regalia. However, his classmate Snow Schmidlkoffer usually brings his own beads or other adornments to add something special. I was gifted some orange things two or three years ago. So I've started blending orange into my stuff too. Uh, so my bandolier is primarily the colors are green and yellow, but I had some nice orange accent beads that I had bought at a thrift store. They were just in a bag. And I'm going to uh, put one of those in each one of these rows to kind of give me an accent color of my orange to help tie it into my regalia also. Deer and the other participants feel like those extra flares make the pieces individual and unique. She often picks simple projects that require only a few hours to complete, so participants walk away with new skills and a beautiful creation. We've all been there where you've taken a class and you don't quite finish and you know you pack it all up and take it home and go, oh yeah, I'm going to finish this and then it sits on the shelf and you never really do finish it. I've done that before in my life. 
So I, I don't ever like to see that happen because everyone's always excited to walk out with a finished product, whether you wear it, whether you have it to take to, as a gift for somebody, or you just want to go home and show it off and say, look what I did. When it comes to beading and crafts, Baker has mostly taught herself. She takes classes like those at the CHC and attends beading groups in her community. She makes jewelry for her daughters and teaches them how to bead as well. Baker believes the importance of art shows itself every day. Because it's part of our heritage and we need to keep it. Nobody else is going to teach us. So we have to teach each other. What you learn, you share with those that want to learn, and especially the younger generation. As a teacher and artist, Deer agrees. She notes spending time together and passing on the skills holds as much importance as the finished product. One person's accomplishment sometimes inspires the whole class, and many of her students surpass their own expectations. Arts are important because it's who we are. It's part of our culture. It's a way of communicating. It's a way of marking time. It's a way of remembrance. It's a way of celebration. Uh, it's a way of looking to the future. So um, without art, it's almost like there is no culture. Mm. Oh, it was nice to have. It's beautiful. All right, I'm out of here. Thank well, you, thank you for coming another today, Paul. Enjoyed it. Do you want to keep this in case you want to make another one? You're just going to go off your uh, The you. classes offer many basic skills that apply to larger or more complex pieces for the future. They are free and open to everyone, and the CHC provides most of the materials. Registration is required and class sizes are limited. Find a calendar of classes and sign up at cpn.news backslash events. March is National Credit Education Month. The Citizen Potawatomi Community Development Corporation guides CPN tribal members and employees at no cost as they build their credit, helping them to reduce interest rates, qualify for home loans, and accomplish their financial goals. While an individual's credit score does not account for their entire financial portfolio, it affects their ability to obtain low interest rates on car loans, qualify for home loans, or fund business ventures. Many people know a high credit score helps and a low credit score hurts, but not how to improve or manage one. CPCDC Commercial Loan Officer and Certified Credit Counselor Felicia Freeman helps clients fill in these knowledge gaps. Back when I was in school, I didn't learn any of this. So we don't know what we don't know. Uh, and if we've ever touched credit and it's, it was hot and we got burnt, we stepped away and we never looked back. Uh, but we're learning now that you can rebuild your credit fairly easy with some of the products that CDC has. In a recent interview with Hanukkah Podcast, Freeman pointed out most people's credit score increases once they've learned about its components. The three main credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, consider a few main conditions when calculating a credit score. All three bureaus use a little bit different um, algorithm or matrix, if you will. They put different percentages, but it's the same things that they're looking at. Paying bills on time remains the most effective means of raising and keeping a high credit score, counting for upwards of 35% of the algorithm. Freeman educates her clients on how to look at it from the credit bureau's point of view. Together, they decide what areas need assistance and discuss manageable, straightforward ways to lift their financial portfolio. Freeman and CPN's Community Development Financial Institution also helps clients with no credit score build one from scratch. In the beginning, when people have no credit or they've lost their job, gotten divorced, maybe even been ill, uh, and things were let go, you know, eight years ago, the first thing I tell them to do is let's get some good stuff going. The CPCDC offers several tools and one-on-one -on -one services, including credit counseling, credit building loans, employee loans, and commercial loans for business owners. She enjoys seeing the guidance and education turn into success. Most credit unions, and of course all CDFIs have them, uh, but it's a pay-it-forward loan. So it is a secured loan because we're securing the loan with the money that you deposit every month into an account to pay your loan payment. Another factor to consider is auto loans. The CPCDC began the Jumpstart Auto Loan Program for tribal employees in 2010 to help alleviate those pressures, offer better loan terms, and build credit from a car payment instead. You have to have a car to get back and forth to work. And that's exactly why the CDC started the auto program, was there were so many employees that were getting taken by these buy here, pay here, places that typically don't report your good payment history.
The CPCDC also assists CPN tribal members on the path toward home ownership. Freeman emphasizes that it is more attainable than many people think. As one of the most memorable success stories in her 15 years, Freeman remembers helping someone take out a home loan after a divorce and a decade of renting. Never underestimate uh, your credit and what you can do to make it work for you. The CPCDC and Freeman assist Native American entrepreneurs fund their business ventures. Sometimes that means improving their credit in addition to counseling sessions with staff before applying for a loan. Whatever their needs, CPN's CDFI has options. I think we're all really hopeful people. None of us think we're going to lose our jobs, get divorced, or get sick. So that's typically what I see is every one of us take out a loan specifically to pay it back and to obtain whatever we're purchasing. Uh, But life happens. The CBCDC offers tribal members and CPN employees the chance to take control of their finances. Find out more about the department and its offerings at cpcdc.org or on Facebook at CPNCDFI. It's time for learning language when the CPN Language Department joins us to teach vocabulary, songs, stories, and more. In this segment, Department Director Justin Neely tells the story of how the porcupine got his quills. Ah, bonjour, Jack. How are y'all doing? Justin Nadezhnikas, Bodewad Mimwan Naganit. Now I'm the Parome Language Director. Shishibaniak Nadabendagwas. Um, I'm a citizen Potawatomi, I'm Potawatomi, and uh, I want to talk a little bit today about uh, some winter stories. Winter stories uh, were traditionally told, obviously, in the wintertime, um, and those stories were usually told when there was snow on the ground and, and whatnot, and that's kind of the best case scenario. Now, when we move down here to Oklahoma, it's a little more difficult to kind of adhere to those kind of ideals because... There's years where we hardly have any snow. You know, we might have one or two days where we have really good snows. And it's kind of hard to plan to tell those if, if you don't really know when that that freak snowstorm might occur. Um, now, up north, you have periods of time where it snows, and that snow stays on the ground until winter's over. Like, it's there. Um, so in order to adhere to these kind of cultural uh, um, understandings uh, that we were told by our elders and whatnot, uh, we do try to tell these stories only in the winter time, and so if you would uh, please, within your own families, try to adhere to that and share these stories with your family in the winter time. Um, winter time was also a good time to tell these stories anyway, because who wants to go outside when it's negative twenty outside, and everybody gets a little stir crazy when they've been in the wigwam or in your house for long periods of time in really cold weather. So it makes perfect sense. But we also believe that the spirits are asleep and the earth is asleep during this time. And that's kind of why we like to tell these stories. Uh, Today, I'm going to tell one of these winter stories. And I kind of want to let you know that we are going to have a winter storytelling event here in Shawnee. And we're also going to make it live uh, on Zoom for those of you that don't live locally. But this one I want to share with you today is about porcupine and how the porcupine, how Gok, some people also call him Gedede is another word for him, how he got to have these these thorns or these uh, little spiky things on him. So Benoe, a long time ago, he was uh, he was kind of a little furry, pudgy little animal, just real, just like you'd, oh, you just want to grab him and hug him, just a real furry, soft little creature. And he was wandering out there in the Tukwa Keek in the woods, and uh, McColl, the bear, saw him. And as soon as that bear saw him, he started charging toward him, he started running toward that, that gawk, that porcupine. And of course, the porcupine, ah, kit noms and ah, zags it. Of course, he was really scared, and so uh, Webby wet. You know, he ran off and uh, took Colzit uh, oh, uh, Mtuk, and then he climbed up this tree to get away from the bear. And uh, while he was up there, he ended up climbing up a hawthorn tree. And he, and while he, when he went up the tree, he got stabbed by a couple of those thorns on that hawthorn tree. And it was like, ah, oh, man. But he's just sitting there thinking, man, that's this is this is a painful existence that I, every time I see some one of these predator animals, I've got to run off and take off because they would just make a big meal out of me. So it's just kind of a rough life that way. And and he, he ran into these thorns. And he thought, man, I wonder if I can use these thorns in some way to maybe make life a little easier for myself. And so he got himself um, some some mud and some dirt, and he kind of took some of these uh, these thorns off this hawthorn tree, and he put him on his back. 
and he kind of attached them there to his back. And so the next day, um, he was wandering around uh, in the woods again, the Mtukwa Creek, and this time Mako, the Mako saw him and again charged at him. You know, Nasquat came running at him, charged him, and this time though, Gak Chogi Webi Wesi. So this time he didn't run away. Well, Wigi Webi Wesi, he didn't run away. And uh, the bear is kind of thinking to himself, Mako Ninduka, Wanakshana, Bagaji, Bakade, Anodajopian Goma. Well, this is kind of nice. I'm, I'm I'm hungry today, so this is good. This is a good deal. This, he's not even taking off. I'm going to have me a nice little uh, Bagaji, we a nice little snack. Boamshe, we snack, we snack now quick before lunch. And so he ran up and he's running up on that porcupine and he sees him and he's not moving. He's like, okay, here we go. And he just takes a big. <laughs> Big old bite out of that porcupine. And it just takes him just a split second. And then he's like, ah! and he just screams out in pain. And he's like, ah, and he just takes off, wet be wet. And he runs off. And that porcupine's like, okay, okay, these 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 hawthorns, they work. This is a pretty good deal. The next day, uh, same kind of scenario. He's Gak Bamosem Tukwaki. He's wandering through the woods. And uh, this time, Mo'oe, the wolf, sees him. Mo'oe. Mo'oe, he, uh, he sees that gawk from a distance. And then the, at the same time, that Mako kind of comes out of the woods. That bear comes out at the same time. And the Mo'oe kind of is thinking to himself, Oh, man, uh, scan, uh, uh, Mako, wigi uh, wabmani gawk. And that, that bear already saw that uh, that porcupine. Uh, scan, ah, uh, ketnam jana, gonindaman. Oh, man, I'm really hungry. I'm starving. And that bear, that Mako takes a look at that porcupine. And then he just, wet, wet, be wet, and he turns and he just runs away. And Moe is kind of, kind of sitting there and just kind of scratching his uh, shtugu on his head and thinking, you know, what the heck's wrong with this guy? Okay, well, I mean, hey, this is my lucky day. I thought for sure Bear was going to run down there and, and gobble that porcupine up. But hey, good deal. Now I'm going to go after him. So he starts charging that porcupine, that, that Moe. And again, the gawk, he's just kind of sitting there. I jeep to bay. And then the waja waja webuk thinking to yourself, oh, I wonder what's gonna happen there. Just kind of sitting there, and that that moe runs up just like that mo- mako that bear, and he just opens his mouth and hum, just takes a big old bite out of that porcupine, and he's like, ah, and just screams out, howls, ooh, ooh, just ah, just in terrible pain, just takes off running, and uh, so. Uh, Wiske, uh, sometimes called Nana Bojo, the trickster Wiske, he's, he's been watching this kind of kind of play out, and he's like, man, Ketnam Bwakao's at Ogak. Man, that, that porcupine, he's a pretty smart feller. I'm going to see if I can do something to help him out so that he can kind of keep that as kind of a permanent feature for himself. He's pretty smart. And so he, he goes up to that Gok, and he tells him, he says, yeah, you know, you are. You get him Bwakao's. You're a smart guy. I'm, I want to help you. I want to do something to make it so we can kind of make this this device you come up with permanent. Because each time it would happen, he'd have to go grab some more hawthorns and some mud and put them on his back. And it's you know, kind of a tedious little little deal that he had to always do. And he said, okay. So he went and got him some clay and he put that on that, really got it on thick on that porcupine's back. And he and he got some of those hawthorns and really kind of placed them in there really good. And uh and said, okay, so next time that uh, they come after you, you're going to be set. You're going to have these little quills, and they're going to they're gonna take care of you, so you don't have to worry anymore. And that's why today the porcupine has quills. Yo. The Citizen Potawatomi Nation Language Department hosts a winter storytelling event on March 3rd from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. It will be on Zoom as well as in person at CPN's Cultural Heritage Center. Find more information on the Potawatomi Language Facebook group. Hanukkah Podcast is produced and brought to you by Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Public Information Department. Our director is Jennifer Bell. Don't forget to subscribe to us on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find what you listen to. We're also on Facebook at Citizen Potawatomi Nation and on Twitter at C underscore P underscore N. Visit us on the web and find digital editions of the tribal newspaper at potawatomi.org. That's P-O-T-A-W-A-T-O-M-I dot org. Until next time, I'm Paige Willett. Miigwech nikanek, bamamina. Thank you, friends.
See you later.